Um, Hello, everybody. This is Jim Van Valkenburg with Froling Energy, and uh, happy that you're able to come today to our, our webcast. Today's talk is about air emissions compliance with biomass boilers with John Hinckley. John Hinckley is the uh, senior project manager with all four environmental compliance and consulting services. He's worked in the field of air emissions permitting, modeling, and control since 1998 when he completed the first project, which was permitting a wood waste boiler for a New Hampshire lumber mill. He's worked in a variety of clients since then all over the country in renewable energy, power generation, forest products, manufacturing, asphalt, aggregate, concrete, healthcare, education, even ski areas. I think he just does that because he free ticket to get there. But uh, John is a, uh, a qualified environmental professional through the Institute for Professional Environmental Practice. And uh, he, he's in the field of, of air pollution control. And uh, he's an active member of the Air and Waste Management Association. He's received a bachelor's degree in environmental science from the University of Vermont and a master's in environmental science and engineering from the University of Virginia. He, uh, he uh, enjoys uh, helping people uh, get through the compliance process, which tend to be pretty daunting for, for most situations. There's a lot of technical federal and state regulations and trying to get them in compliance is really his joy. John's goal is for this webinar is so that you're more comfortable just with air emissions permitting and are prepared to enter a biomass project with your eyes wide open. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, thanks a lot, Jim. Appreciate that, and uh, thanks everybody for joining uh, today. And I'm excited to share with you what I've learned along the way, and um, happy to answer your questions and and, and learn from those as well. So, um, first of all, uh, Jim, can you hear me and can you see my screen? See the um, slides, the first slide. I think we're fine, John. So send okay. a, if anybody can't hear or so has a problem, you know, please please send a chat message and we'll we'll take care of you. All right, great. So uh, yeah, so as in, entitled, um, I'd like to talk with you about air emissions considerations for biomass boilers. Um, I'm I'm based in Vermont. My contact information is a little uh, dubious there. Um, my landline has a 610 exchange uh, because my company's headquarters is in Pennsylvania, but I reside in Vermont, uh, hence the 802 area code for my, for my mobile device. So let's jump in. And um, I'm going to, I'm already in, oh, here we go. I need to frame advance this way. Okay. I'm, I'm not an advanced WebEx user. I use Teams, so bear with me as I figure some of the nuances out along the way here. So uh, I have two hopes for today. Uh, they're for those who are, are, first of all, not new to the world of biomass emissions. Um, you know, my hope is that um, you would walk away from this talk feeling um, more well-versed um, regarding maybe what regulatory factors or other factors could impact how you're um, involved in an existing biomass system. So for those of you who are facilities operators, um, hope you'll walk away from this feeling like you've learned something new. Um, and for those of you who are, are new uh, to the world of biomass emissions, um, really hope that, um, that you would feel like at the end of this presentation that you'd know what questions to ask um, so you can walk into a biomass project with your eyes wide open. And, and really, I think this applies um, to both who are new and not new. Not new. Um, you know, hope is that um, what you learned today and would enable you to one day say, boy, uh, so that someday you're not saying, oh, boy, if I, if I knew then what I know now, I would have done things differently. So um, none of us really like to have to say that. So I really hope that um, I'll be able to help us all um, be more informed looking forward. Um, so with that, um, biomass emissions field is pretty broad. And so I wanna focus us 
today um, on what I'm going to call area sources or also referred to as minor sources. Um, wouldn't be what's called major sources, also referred to maybe as Title V or PSD sources. Um, and I want to focus on facilities that are either burning or producing uh, natural wood products. So wood chips, wood pellets um, that are in their natural form. And lastly, I'll focus on wood boilers that are less than 100 million BTU an hour heat input. Okay, so that's our focus. A um, little more on the overview, have uh, a number of um, topics I'd like to cover here, and um, we'll try to go a little more than scratching the surface for, for all of them. But with no further ado, uh, let's, let's move into an overview of air pollution. There are lots of sources of air pollution, both uh, natural and not natural. So um, let's not forget that, you know, we do get air pollution from, say, volcanoes and wildfires, um, the natural sources, of course. And then there's lots of uh, non-natural ones from our cities, um, agricultural productions, um, mining and manufacturing, and um, from our transportation sector. Um, this slide shows emissions going up into the sky, but um, it doesn't show actually that some emissions come back down. They can precipitate out of the atmosphere back to the ground, um, say, for example, as acid rain um, and pollute our surface and groundwater. So, you know, certainly behooves us to, to control our emissions because they don't just go up in the air always and, and stay in the air. Okay, this might be a somewhat confusing slide, so I'll just take a little while to explain it. Um, this I copied from uh, the US EPA website and what it shows are pollutant, average pollutant levels for the whole country for seven pollutants. Um, so it's a nationwide average of those seven pollutants. And um, sounds like someone might need to mute. Sorry. Um, and now sounds like the person is muted. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So um, the, the, the lines here are all standardized. They show the pollutant levels uh, as a percent of each pollutant's standard or air standard or the, the ceiling or the highest level that EPA allows the pollutant concentration to get to in our atmosphere. So that dotted line in the middle is 0%. That's the standard. Everything below it means that um, we're meeting the standard. Everything above it means we're not. Um, so this, this chart goes from 1990 to roughly now 2019. Um, doesn't go out to 2020. And what I wanted to point out is that these curves, as you go from left to right, they, they all go down. Um, they're all declining. Um, and eventually they're all below the 0% line or meaning that we're meeting the standard. And what's interesting is that that's all happening despite increases in population growth, vehicle miles traveled, you know, cars, trucks, and so on, um, and increases in gross domestic product. So um, it's my view that the Clean Air, Clean Air Act is, is helping. Um, while it may not be perfect, it is, it is helping. And before I leave this slide, just wanted to point out one um, one line, one curve. The green one is for a pollutant called PM 2.5, also referred to as fine particulate matter. Um, we'll talk more about that pollutant, but that's that's a pollutant that tends to come up the most in biomass projects. It's a pollutant that can be breathed deep into your lungs, and so our goal is to um, minimize and disperse those emissions as much as possible. The good news is that um, PM 2.5 levels, at least on an annual basis, have been steadily declining. Um, all this being said, um, you know, it, levels may be higher in some parts of the country or lower in other parts, but, but generally on a state-by-state -state basis, I think we can say that overall pollutant levels have been falling since 1990. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about air pollutants. There are three categories I'll touch on, the criteria, hazardous air pollutants, and greenhouse gases. 
And of the criteria, we have fine particulate matter, which we just talked about, PM2.5, and, and coarse particulate matter, PM10. Those particles are bigger than the PM2.5 ones. Um, we have some gases like carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, volatile organic compounds, ozone, and lead. So those are criteria pollutants that EPA regulates. Again, PM2.5 is, is one that comes up a lot with biomass projects. Our hazardous air pollutants, um, they're also referred to as air toxics generally. Um, they're ones that um, could potentially cause cancer, although there's other ones that um, you know are short-term irritants. But at any rate, uh, it's another category. Um, and the beware I have here is that um, they're referred to differently in different states. Um, and there's not necessarily a one-for-one one between the states and EPA. So um, Vermont has its HACs or hazardous air contaminants. New Hampshire has regulated toxic air pollutants. And New York has high toxicity air contaminants. So um, you need to be wary of the state you're in and how that particular state refers to air toxics. Um, all that being said, uh, individual states are required to look at HAPS as well as their own version of air toxics. Last but not least, we have our greenhouse gases. Uh, here's a partial list, methane, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide. Uh, and by the way, the, um, the, the black smoke plume there, um, that's just a picture I found um, that would contrast well with the white font of the letters. It's not a biomass boiler <laughs> um, and, and certainly not indicative of a, a boiler that's operating um, correctly and, and not what I, what I observe in the field, but good for graphics. So um, the question I get asked a whole lot is, what are the levels of emissions from biomass boilers? You know, um, what are the emissions from a, a wood chip boiler compared with a gas boiler or a propane or an oil or a six oil or coal fired boiler? You know, how do they compare? And they, they hate when I say this, because I always say it, it just, it depends. And um, there's reasons for that. Um, I'll list a couple. Um, it'll depend on the, the type of wood. Um, is it a wood chip or a wood pellet? Depend upon the quality of the fuel. Are there impurities in it? Is it dirty? Is it gonna not burn, be clean because of that? Is it too wet? Um, could depend upon the size of the boiler and how the boiler is tuned and how well it's taken care of or maintained. Um, could depend upon how well the bed of coals on the grate, say for a stoker boiler, um, how well that's managed. Um, and um, could depend upon whether or not you have back end emission controls or sometimes people refer to them as end of pipe controls. So, um, you know, the world of biomass emissions is, is very case by case. There's some, some standardization and some similarities, but um, emissions really depend and it's, um, you really have to look at every uh, situation independently for the most part. So speaking of backend controls, let's just talk a little bit about them. Um, I divide pollution controls into two categories. Uh, first, the best management practice, and the second being the back-end controls. So the BMPs are what can you do upstream, and the back-end controls are what can you do downstream, um, generally speaking, to control emissions. So I have a few best management practices listed here. Um, they're, they're kind of mostly common sense type um, practices. They can get a little bit technical, but you know, the obvious one to me is uh, maximizing your fuel quality and having maybe a fuel spec in your contract. Um, tell you a quick story. I had a facility that um, was um, receiving complaints from its neighbor, and um, that was a result of fuel um, that was too wet being delivered. The, the boiler couldn't handle the moisture content of the fuel, and so it was periodically smoking a little bit. So we resolved that by establishing a fuel spec and by inspecting the moisture content of the fuel upon delivery. And as a result, the facility received drier wood and lo and behold, 
bloom was invisible and the complaints went away. So maximizing fuel quality is really important. Um, sort of things like equipment sensors where you're, you're monitoring the oxygen and the temperature um, in the combustion chamber, maybe also the stack or maybe in the breaching between the combustor and the stack and monitoring that data and feeding it back to the boiler controls to make sure you have the proper air to fuel mixture on the fly. That can be really good. Um, another kind of common sense BMP is performing um, visual observations of the plume or you know, literally standing outside uh, with the sun at your back and observing your stack for a matter of a few seconds or a minute or two, um, making sure that you don't have excess emissions. Um, I'll just add that EPA has a few methods, uh, method nine and 22 that you can follow. Um, they aren't always required, but sometimes they come into play. Um, last three things are, again, more common sense, block and tackling types of BMPs, you know, performing regular tune-ups, performing regular maintenance, uh, doing thorough record keeping. Um, so those are some BMPs that popped into mind for me. Again, there's, I'm sure there's others, and maybe if you're listening today, you're thinking of other ones as well. So those are our upstream pollution control measures. Uh, moving down to our downstream ones, I want to talk about three pollution control devices, uh, bag houses, ESPs, and cyclones. So we'll start with a fabric filter bag house. Um, like it says, you're relying on the principle of fabric filtration to remove particles from the exhaust or flue gas, whichever term you want to use. Um, I don't see a whole lot of these in my work. I've dealt with a handful of them um, over two decades. Um, they're very useful and, and, and with the right application, they're the right thing, but um, their, their entry into the market for biomass at least has been limited by issues stemming from the high moisture content of wood boiler exhaust, as well as potential fire threats, you know, of um, embers being carried over into the bags and triggering a fire. So um, bag houses can be designed to work with wood boiler systems. There are those that are in operation, but there are, are some risks. Um, bag houses are fairly expensive in the realm of pollution control devices, but not, not the most expensive one. The electrostatic precipitator, um, this is pretty commonly installed. We see a lot of these with facilities that um, are required to meet a stringent emission limit for particulate matter. Um, in short, they're like a big magnet. Um, exhaust or flue gas goes in, it gets charged, and then there are these collection plates that are charged oppositely from the particles and they just attract those particles. Um, they get wrapped or banged and the particles fall out and um, into hoppers and are collected within 55 gallon drums typically and then disposed. Um, ESPs, um, of the three devices that I'm going to describe have um, probably the highest uh, capital cost, but may have the lowest operating cost. So um, as you forecast out 10, 20, maybe 30 years, um, you know, an ESP might be the most effective and um, cost effective, at least over the long haul. Um, safety is not a concern with ESPs. Um, as it is with bag houses, although um, in some cases vendors uh, recommend pre-filtering an ESP with a simple cyclone to mitigate fire risk. Okay, last but not least is cyclone technology. Um, relies on the principle of inertial separation. Idea is you're spinning the exhaust around a cyclone, um, like being on a playground when you you're a little hard to hold on when it starts spinning fast. So those particles hit the sides of a cyclone and drop out. Um, there are single cyclones, which are fairly basic and least expensive. And then they're what I call high efficiency multi-cyclones, um, more expensive, more efficient. They collect more particles. Um, the high efficiency multi-clones um, tend to have um, higher power bills because you need a relatively powerful fan to overcome a pressure drop, which is used to filter out the particles. Um, these devices uh, don't do the best job on super fine particles, um, but, but I do see, see them being installed in, in current day um, projects. Um, 
but but they tend to be uh, the overall the least expensive of all the three uh, that I just uh, described. Okay, so we're going to shift into a slightly different gear here and talk about your permitting. Um, some of you have uh, gone through the air permitting process. Some of you have not. So um, just want to go over a few aspects of, of what is an air permit. I've got a threefold definition that I um, downloaded from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, which I think is is really good. Um, so uh, first of all, an air permit is a legally binding document that includes enforceable limits on air missions which you have to comply with. And so what that means is um, if you have an air permit and you don't comply with it, um, lawyers could get involved <laughs> or consultants. Um, so it's it's a real deal. It, 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 it's a weighty document and um, it's really important to take uh, what's, uh, what's uh, take the permit process seriously. An air permit will specify how a facility has to operate its pollution control equipment. So might have detail on how you have to operate your bag house or ESP or cyclones. We'll also um, describe pollutant emission limits you have to meet. And those pollutant emission limits um, can help you figure out what type of pollution control device you need. Um, and lastly, uh, can tell you how to monitor and report the emissions from uh, an emission source. Thirdly, um, air permits are, are, are implemented to protect human health. Um, at the end of the day, um, the permit is kind of like the, uh, uh, the manifestation of the Clean Air Act at your facility, that you know, two-page or 20-page document. Um, that is um, how the Clean Air Act essentially has been translated for your facility so that your facility won't um, adversely impact air quality or human health. So, um, you know, I've, I've been, been in situations where clients have been actually relieved that their project triggers their permitting um, just because it forces them to go through a process uh, where at the end of the day, um, you know, they've, they've had a project that's been reviewed maybe by an engineer, a consultant, as well as state regulators, and it's been blessed by the state and um, they can sleep a little better at night um, knowing um, they've gone through the process. Okay. So I uh, just want to reiterate, you know, why we need to consider it. I'm probably already sort of said that already, but um, I want to emphasize that permitting can affect the schedule of your project uh, when you can actually build it. Um, I want to reemphasize that it can impact the design of it, what type of end of control device you might need or what kind of BMPs you might need, um, what your stack needs to be. Um, and um, it, again, therefore, um, can impact the cost of your project. So it's, it's just uh, air permits can, um, should be very carefully um, anticipated and considered. Okay, um, next slide. So, Couple more bullets here. Um, and again, I feel like I'm starting to repeat myself a little bit, but in advance of and during the permit process, and even if you don't need an air permit, these are questions I'd suggest you ask. Um, it's a partial list, but um, yeah. The last bullet there, when can I, the last two ones, when can I order equipment and when can I start construction? Um, I have a little warning slide here. Uh, typically, very little construction is allowed before a permit is issued. Uh, that's been my experience. Uh, so, in other words, in some states, they may only let you, um, say, clear the land and, you know, put up flagging and build a driveway to your site. Um, other states may allow you to build most of your project, but 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 may not allow you to put together the equipment that would um, in other words, they let you receive the equipment, but not put it together. Uh, that is the equipment that would make uh, air emissions. So it's, it's super important to uh, talk with your regulators up front and ask them you know, what they allow for construction. Super important to ask them 
how long it would take to receive the permit. Um, knowing those two things, you can plan your construction schedule. You can plan your equipment ordering schedule. All right, so a um, lot going on this slide here. I'm not going to talk too in depth about it, but the point of this slide is that permit applicability varies on a state by state basis for area sources or, or minor sources. Um, so what this is showing is when a permit would be triggered by the size of the boiler or the heat input. So let's just say, for example, we wanted to install a boiler whose heat input was, let's just say 4 million BTU an hour. So at 4 million, it looks like you'd have to go through permitting in Connecticut, possibly Maine. Uh, Maine has some other nuances and Vermont. Um, again, um, important to consider state permitting thresholds and also um, important to uh, evaluate if there are any other possible permit triggers beyond the size of the boiler you'd like to permit. So don't, please don't just go by this slide. Um, last thing I'll mention about this slide is on the far right, uh, this is the red, um, red column there is the EPA new source performance standard threshold, NSPS, um, that's where the NSPS um, becomes involved. Um, doesn't mean that you have to get a permit with EPA, it just, it just put it in there to show you when a certain uh, federal requirement, set of federal requirements or a federal rule would kick in. So having alluded to federal requirements, let's talk a little bit more about them. Um, one thing I want you to remember regarding federal requirements is that um, they may not, uh, sorry, excuse me, in some cases you may not need an air permit from a state pollution control agency, but you still are subject to federal requirements. So just keep that in mind. A um, little more, a few more slides on federal requirements. Um, you know, as I mentioned, they might apply even if a permit is not required. Um, have a bullet in there for the new source performance standards, which will kick in for certain size boilers. And then the standard that um, tends to affect most wood boilers is the NESHAPS, National Emission Standards for Hazardous Air Pollutants. Um, in case you haven't figured this out already, there's so many acronyms in the biomass air emissions field. So um, um, that's just part of the deal. So, um, the niche apps are also have also been called the boiler MAC rule, area source rule, 6J rule, and um, kick in for hot water boilers with boilers equal to or greater than 1.6 million BTU an hour. Um, there's no real well defined um, floor for steam boilers, so um, possible it could apply for um, smaller than 1.6 million BTU an hour boilers. The outline on the right there, I won't go through all of that, but the point there is just to kind of graphically show some requirements. Uh, the requirements are um, dependent upon a number of factors, including when you commence construction, size of the boiler, um, how much the duration of use, how many months of year you run it, um, and uh, whether or not you use oxygen trim. Okay, so let's shift from federal requirements over to possible new state regulations. Um, one thing that's really important um, when you are applying for a permit is to talk with your state regulators about potential new regulations that could impact your project. You don't want to um, have to retrofit your project down the road to comply with a new regulation. You want to anticipate that and be ready for it. So, uh, with no further ado, I um, want to offer just a partial list of some possible regulatory changes. I'm um, just going to talk about changes in three states. Um, there could be changes in every state of the country, but I am not going to drag you through that. Uh, so, let's just jump in. Um, so, let's start with New Hampshire. Um, New Hampshire has a rule called ENVA 1400. It's there. Air toxics regulation. Um, it's likely that it will be updated perhaps by the end of this year or maybe next year. Um, 
you know, the world is sort of unpredictable now with COVID. Um, but as far as I know, it's it's due for updating. Um, my experience is that it's been updated every few years. Um, and once it's updated, you have about 90 days, we well, have 90 days to comply with the rule typically. Um, what I wanna point out is that um, it wouldn't apply to wood boilers burning uh, wood chips or wood pellets or other fuels. Um, it would apply to fuel production facilities that um, involve some type of drying of the wood. So like a wood pellet mill um, or a dry wood chip mill, um, th those facilities are subject to ENVA 1400 um, and may need to um, may need to make some changes um, based upon changes to 1400. So um, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I, I don't know all the ins and outs of how 1400 will be changed, um, but I, I do know that it's likely to be changed um, in the foreseeable future. So I'm personally trying to um, anticipate the changes of, of the rule. Okay, so that's New Hampshire. I uh, wanna skip over Vermont to the west to New York. Um, some of you may be aware that uh, New York is proposing changes to subpart 227.1. I wanna stress that uh, the changes are proposed, they are, are not finalized um, and would apply to both existing and new biomass boilers between one and 50 million BTU an hour heat input. And it would impose PM limits, particulate matter limits, uh, if more stringent federal limits uh, did not already apply. So if, if uh, NSPS or NESHAPS limits um, did not apply, then it would, um, it would apply. So what are the limits? Uh, we have a limit of PM, uh, a PM limit of 0.10 pounds per million BTU for existing facilities. And the deal with that is you'd have to comply within two years of promulgating of the rule of when the rule's finalized. And if you're planning to build a new facility uh, after the rule is finalized, then um, you would need to comply with 0 0.10 um, right away. So um, it's a you know, very important rule if you plan to do a project in New York um, if it is finalized as proposed, then uh, as I understand it, what I just read to you would apply. So again, I uh, need to stay tuned here uh, to see what will, will actually happen. So in my state of Vermont, um, they are considering replacing the HMSER determination. So what happens in Vermont is we have an air toxics rule that um, can trigger an evaluation of emissions and result in emission limits. It's somewhat case by case, and um, what the state is considering, and then this is all, uh, this is not formal, it's only been in discussion. Uh, there's no proposed rule change or anything like that, but uh, state's considering um, replacing HMSER, HMSER with complying with a performance standard for PM particulate matter and carbon monoxide. So the idea here is um, facilities that comply with a PM limit of X and a CO limit of Y um, are exempt from HMSER. Okay, so just wanna reemphasize nothing formal yet. It's all talk at this point, but again, just another example of the importance of anticipating changes in state rules. A couple more things I want to talk about, and then uh, we'll wrap up. Um, really want to talk just a little bit about emissions modeling, because I think it's important to understand how that can um, help you plan a project. So let's just dive into that. So the gist of modeling is that you're using a computer model. In this case, it's one developed by EPA. And the model, um, estimates the concentrations of pollutants from the stack of your boiler, for example. And the models are physically based. They take into account existing pollutant levels. Uh, you can put in um, actual weather data, wind speed, wind direction. Um, you can put in information about the emissions. A uh, model can um, predict concentrations of what's called receptors 
takes into account the topography. So it, it takes into account quite a bit um, in order to um, estimate the concentrations um, coming from the stack and then ultimately to predict concentrations of pollutants. And if your concentrations are below um, pollutant allowable limits, then that, that's key that um, your project will not likely cause any environmental or human health impacts. So this is sort of, I'm just sort of buzzing through this, but just wanna reiterate that, um, that modeling is a great step-by-step -step process to kind of confirm the design of your project is not going to affect people adversely. A couple more slides here. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about building downwash. Uh, the idea here is that as your plume moves, in this case, from left to right, um, it could be drawn downward by turbulent airflow over a building. And we wanna try to minimize that. And we don't want um, air emissions drawn into air intakes or operable windows. So um, just to talk a little more in depth about this, um, you look at this from left to right, you really wanna design your project so your stack extends up in that upper left portion here of what's, what's labeled as the undisturbed region where the airflow is kind of straight or some people use the term laminar. Um, if you have a real short stack, it could get caught up in this um, really turbulent area in the cavity region and the wake region there that are in these um, lower right corners. So, um, point is that you best to try to build your stack so you're up into that undisturbed region as far as possible. Uh, this slide just shows that um, reemphasizes the point that every situation is different, really. I mean, on the lower right, sorry, lower left corner, we have a building which is relatively a stack, which is relatively tall relative to the building, and on the right, stacks which are relatively short relative to their building. So um, these models can take into account um, varying building geometry, topography, weather conditions. So um, the actual stack height's not a cookie cutter. It, it really can vary on a site-by-site -site basis. Here's a, an image of uh, some buildings I created in a model just to show you the models can take into account different kinds of structures. Um, like tanks and um, A-frame buildings and rectangular buildings. This right here just shows how you can um, program some information into a model. Point here is that we can do some what-if scenarios. We can plug in different stack location, height, exhaust flow rate, stack diameter, different pollutant emission rates, all things that you consider within a project design and you can do some what if scenarios. So you, know, you configure the model to um, have a 50 foot stack and you don't meet air standards, then you can reprogram it to run with a 70 foot stack. And if you meet air standards, then maybe you call it there and say you wanna have a 70 foot stack. So um, lots of what if scenarios are capable of um, being explored with, with air modeling. One more thing, and then I will leave everybody alone. I um, want to emphasize it's really important to do your compliance planning. Um, the idea here is that the party isn't over when you get your permit. Um, a lot of effort goes into getting that permit and demonstrating compliance to get it, but the permit does include a number of requirements that you need to be prepared for. Um, so, um, important to ask the question you know, do you have a post permit? compliance plan. And what I mean by that is um, your permit requires notifications, maybe monitoring, record keeping, reporting, and possibly stack testing. All these things have to be performed after the permit's issued. So it's, it's important to anticipate what the permit might require um, as you develop your project, as, as these requirements can affect how you operate and, and what the cost will be to run your project. Um, the little chart on the right hand side is something I put together years ago for a client that just needed everything enumerated. So it's just a step by step list of what to do when. Um, I'm not saying it has to be this this is just something in one instance the client 
wanted to do, but it's good to um, put pen to paper or use Excel or some other tool to um, write down what you need to do and by when uh, to comply with your air permit. So I'm gonna wrap up and I don't have conclusions or recommendations. I just have some takeaways uh, in the form of questions that I'll restate. First one is, you know, do I need a, do I need a permit for my state regulatory agency? It's important to know, you know, we talked about how permits can influence the design and cost and operation of your project. And am I subject to federal requirements? You know, they may still apply even if you don't need an air permit. And am I subject to air toxics regulations? Could, could those impact me? What do I need for emissions control? Cyclone, multi-cyclone, baghouse, ESP, scrubber, who knows? How tall does my stack need to be and, and, and where can I put it perhaps? And are there any new state or federal requirements on the horizon that I, that I need to anticipate so I don't have to do a costly retrofit down the road? And do I need to perform air emissions modeling? Um, in many cases it, it is required to get a permit and in many cases it's not, but um, I do um, perform modeling when it's not um, in that it, it has been very useful for um, establishing project design and just helping um, increase sort of the feel good part of a project knowing that um, it's some thought has been put into the emissions side of it. <clears throat> and then the last thing I talked about was the post construction compliance plan, you know, anticipating what needs to be done after that permit is issued. So that's it, folks. Um, I know I had a lot of slides there, but I wanted to make sure I gave you all I could. Um, thanks everyone for hanging in there and bearing with all those acronyms. Um, uh, thanks again, and uh, happy to entertain some questions now if, if folks would uh, like to ask them. That's good, John. And, and you're welcome to unmute yourself and speak if you'd like to. Otherwise, I do have one question from Khaled, who uh, says, is the air permit per single boiler or the total boiler site capacity? So multiple boiler situations, how are they impacted? Right. Um, permits are issued for the, the entire site, the entire facility. Um, so, you know, my experience has been that for example, if you're just permitting one boiler, that's all you have to do. If you want to add a boiler after you have the permit for the first boiler, you have to modify that permit to account for the first and the second boiler. So, um, okay. and, yeah. If you're under the minimum with one boiler, but add a second boiler that's also under the usual minimum for a single boiler, does that trigger? You know, it could be a state by state thing, but does that trigger some sort of air permit requirement if you've got two boilers that are both under that size, the normal size? Um, that's a great question. And in some states, uh, they have, uh, the, there's a, one of the permit triggers are the total facility wide emissions. So um, you might in one state, if you have two boilers and their size is below the permit applicability threshold, but their estimated emissions would exceed the state's facility-wide permit threshold, then in that case, you would need to go through permitting. Gotcha. Sometimes it's a redundant boiler. They wouldn't be burning at the same time often. Yes. Yes, that's okay. right. All right. Any other questions? Here's another one. It says, is the threshold per million BTU of boiler input or output? Now that mm. may be state by state. Yeah, um, another great question. Um, I have, uh, I can't remember a time when it was based on output, honestly. So it, heat input is, is what I would go with. Um, yep. Input, okay. Yep. So in other words, the potential of the fuel at maximum output without efficiency losses? Is that what you're thinking? Um, thinking about 
heat input in terms of the maximum fuel burn rate. Um, so you're, you know, if it's, let's just say the, the applicability threshold is 10 million BTU an hour, that would be the amount of fuel that you would burn or input to the boiler that would amount to 10 million BTUs an hour. So it considers the efficiency of the boiler and the burn and so forth. Um, at least indirectly, yes. Um, he, if your permitting threshold is based on output, well, it really depends on what data is available. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and if your permit threshold is based upon heat output and all you know is the heat input, then you need to know the efficiency of the boiler to calculate the heat output. So Okay. Yeah. Okay. One question that I had was, what if you're a business that, has a permitted boiler and someone looks at a certain day and they say, boy, that's a really smoky stack there. Tell me, you know, I'm going to complain to somebody. And if that complaint goes in, this may be a state by state thing as well, but mm -hmm. what happens? What happens when that, when that kind of complaint arrives at uh, a, a regulatory body and how does mm -hmm. they respond and so forth? Right. Well, um, you know, regulators can respond to that better than I can. I can tell you what I've observed, um, which is that, um, you know, an offhand um, excess emissions day may not trigger any response. Um, something that's maybe a little more regular, um, that's gives a little more weight to the situation. Um, and uh, what, what may happen is um, a complaint, if it's registered with the state regulatory agency, uh, someone perhaps from the enforcement division of the agency might perform a site visit to the facility, um, you know, might, might show up to observe the emissions and, and might um, request a, you know, a tour of the facility to um, make sure that the boiler is being maintained, operated properly. Uh, that would be the first things that would happen and um, you know hopefully some corrective action would be implemented even before the regulators arrived and um, no more action would be necessary so so the hope is that um, you know some corrective action can be implemented very quickly and put the system put the situation to rest okay there's another question here from jason and he says, there are sometimes additional emissions requirements to participate in incentive programs like thermal RECs, say in New Hampshire. Have you found that these requirements are generally pretty reasonable? Do they tend to add additional cost to a project? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, so what, what comes to mind is uh, New Hampshire's thermal REC program, which limits with boilers, I believe 0 0.10 pounds per million BTU of particulate matter. Um, and um, there are some boilers that can meet that without uh, expensive end of pipe control and some boilers cannot. Um, so in my view, if you had a boiler that could didn't require emission control, it would probably feel more reasonable <laughs> um, than if you had to install um, Pollution control. However, um, you know you 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 get a return on your investment in that um, you know, there's value in the wrecks that are produced, for example, in New Hampshire. So that 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 money or that revenue can be used to finance um, the capital and operating costs of the project. So uh, you know, reasonable. Uh, it really it's case by case, and I think can kind of depend upon the person involved um but you know the the projects that i've been a part of i don't i don't recall the the thermal recommission limit being a deal breaker i can't speak to um emission limits in other states though so i frankly i have a somewhat limited um, set of examples i can cite to in our experience at frulling we've put a lot of boilers in that do that, that I should say go 
to qualify for the thermal wrecks. And what we find is that people are generally very sensitive to, to this kind of thing, especially, you know, the bigger the boiler gets. And so they, they are willing to, to go the extra mile to be able to do this. And a lot of the boilers that we deal with don't require a lot of additional equipment, such as the ESPs, that just have, you know, if, if the fuel quality and that all goes to your points in your presentation there, the fuel quality is good or great, then you end up with a much better output. And these, these boilers can be adjusted very often to meet all the, the PM 1.0s and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's not a real big problem, but uh, a big boiler needs to go through the testing. So you certainly um, mm -hmm. need to go through that. And, and, and is that, is there an extra level of performance that you have to meet to do thermal recs? Yes, sometimes, but you know, I should think it's rather situational. There may be, you know, you have to go from this boiler to that boiler and there could be a big expense there, but it could just be on mm -hmm. the sort of threshold that, that just happens. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So, I mean, to put it in context, uh, a boiler less than 10 million um, going for thermal rec is subject to 0 0.10. Once you hit 10 million, you're subject to a federal limit of 0 0.07. So that's 30% lower or more stringent. And then, then if you're if you're installing a boiler that's 30 million, the limit's 0 0.03. So that's 70% more stringent than the thermal rec limit. So it does become more stringent the larger the boiler. Gotcha. Okay. So, John, I thank you very much for the presentation today. We'll be, uh, this is recorded and it will be posted here in the next few days. And uh, if anybody does have any questions, they can always send them to Jim at FrolingEnergy.com and I'll pass them on to John and uh, we'll make sure you get in touch there. But, but uh, John is with all four and uh, I, can, I can also send you his email address should you need that directly. Again, thanks for attending today. We'll thanks everybody. Very good, John. Any final final comments there, big guy? Nope. Um, thanks again, to everyone, for enduring all the acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. 